Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I record all of my lectures to provide evergreen content to support my students that outlast the semester, to support working professionals, and perhaps to encourage people to enter into STEM. Ah, science and engineering, isn't it great? Okay, so what we're going to do now is this is my continuing series in data science basics. We're talking about machine learning, really basic introductions. Please don't don't go here if you're looking for the most advanced methodologies. This is for the newbies to be able to pick up and learn new skills to increase their capabilities. I'm going to talk about machine learning in Python with scikit-learn pipelines in this lecture. Machine learning pipelines in Python for engineers and geoscientists. This is a tutorial, a demonstration of the approach. In Python, the common tool for dealing with machine learning is the pipeline class. It is part of scikit-learn, the Python package. Here's the citation to the original paper for the package. Everybody uses scikit-learn, no surprises. This tutorial includes the methods and operations that be commonly used for engineers and geoscientists or anybody doing basic machine learning modeling with pipelines for the purpose of machine learning model design, abstraction of the process for nice, compact, condensed code. Let's motivate it. Why would we even want to consider working with pipelines? Machine learning workflows can be quite complicated. There's various steps and decisions that need to be made. Consider the fact that we have data preparation, feature engineering transformations. In fact, there's always gonna be transformations. Many of our machine learning methods require transformations. Model parameter training, uh, parameter training hyperparameters like learning rate and momentum used in stochastic gradient descent approaches like gradient boosting and model hyperparameter tuning searching over a large combinatorial of hyperparameters. Then we have to pick select the modeling method including the architectural hyperparameters. And if we're using convolutional neural nets, well how big, how deep, how wide artificial neural nets and so forth. So you can see this is starting to build up. There's a lot of choices. There's a lot of moving parts in machine learning. Modeling metrics, the multiple cross validations like k-fold cross validation required to train and test our models or train, validate, and test our models. This can all be a bookkeeping nightmare. What's interesting is that you may apply machine learning over and over again to a variety of different problems but you have this massive amount of code to do all this and it's all prone to modeling blunders. Wouldn't it be nice if we could back up and have a methodology by which we can do it more efficiently, these types of common steps for machine learning. That's what pipelines are all about. It's a scikit-learn class that allows you to encapsulate the sequence of data preparation and modeling steps. Then we can treat the pipeline as an object and the result is a much more condensed workflow. The pipeline will allow us to improve code readability for sure, guaranteed, and to keep everything straight as far as that bookkeeping nightmare, it goes away. We can avoid common workflow problems like data leakage. What is data leakage? That's where the testing and training sets share information. The way I like to call data leakage is peaking. We're effectively peeking at the testing information, which should be withheld during model training. Okay. The other thing is we can abstract the common machine learning modeling approach and focus on building the best model possible. Now, the fundamental philosophy can get us to an end point where we start thinking about machine learning as a combinatorial search of all possible models. We're trying to build the best model. Uh, some caution there. I don't, I'm not an advocate of the idea of fully automated machine learning. I think there's just a lot that goes into it. We should understand the models. We should be making expert choices. So I'm just going to be a bit cautious around that. Let's recall machine learning. Let's talk about prediction with machine learning. The basic idea is we have a formulation like this. No matter how complicated the model, it's inputs, outputs, predictor features, response features, and we have a model that we're building. Prediction really includes the building of the best possible model, f hat. It's a proxy of the natural setting, f, and it's an estimate to calculate the most accurate estimate of the response feature, y hat.
We're going to train with all available observations of the response feature, Y, with all of the pre associated predictor features, Xs, for all available data, alpha equals 1 through n. Model complexity is tuned by using withheld observations to assure model generalization. What does that mean? We need our model to perform at data values in the solution space that were not included in the training nor the tuning of the model. It's all about building a model that will perform well and not be overfit. All right. If you're interested, I have lectures on all of this around overfit, philosophy, machine learning. I'm not going to be able to provide all of this on one slide. Just a quick recap. Project goals, we want to learn the basics of working in pipelines to do this encapsulation and build this really nice readable code. I'll show you a standard workflow. Then using longhand, using the traditional methodology, I'll repeat it with pipelines and then I'll extend it. And then I'll show a more complicated example. I only demonstrate the most basic workflow of pipelines. There's, of course, much more we can do. There always is, but I want to provide you with something very simple to get started. Let's go ahead and start with importing all of our packages. As I mentioned, or should have mentioned, this is all live code. I'm using Jupyter Slides, which are awesome, using Rise package for these slides. And this is all live code. So I can go ahead and run this code. And you'll notice it's running. I'm importing my packages. I carefully selected all the packages I need. As we go through the workflow, you're going to see you need these. Now, these are all standard Anaconda packages. So they're all, if you have Anaconda 3. Point something installed, you'll be able to run this workflow. And if you want to follow along with the workflow, in fact, it is available on my GitHub account. So if you go to my GitHub account, you go to repositories, Python numerical demos, and you scroll down. Let me expand this out a little bit so we can see. You go all the way down here. You're going to find at Python data basics pipe pipelines. And so this is the workflow that I'm going to show with the slides. You can go ahead and join in and run along with me as I'm talking through it. All right. And the data set is linked to, there's available data set to work with. It'll be very straightforward. Okay, so let's go ahead and carry on. Let's, we're going to define a few functions. Now, all of the functions I include here are included for ease of visualization of the model. You're going to see we're going to work with two predictor features, one response feature. We're going to visualize it as a, as a grid, and we'll be able to see exactly what we're doing, what the models do. And I also have functions to be able to visualize the tuning of the model. So let's go ahead and run that code that ran. We'll go to the next one here. This is just a nice wrapper for ease of running that visualization. We're going to need to use that too. So I'll go ahead. I ran that. And right here, the ability to visualize the tune model. In other words, to see the plot of the error in testing versus hyperparameters. These are just very basic plots. Okay, so we ran all those. We have the functions available to us. You can go ahead and set the working directory. I'm old fashioned. I like to do that, have a working directory because every time I make an image, or I save something out, I just like to know where it goes. And if you have a complicated workflow, you often want to use multiple folders and directories. So I think it's a good idea to do that to stay organized. Let's go ahead and load the data set in. It is available on my GitHub account. I actually have a bunch of example data sets to work with that I think are quite helpful in developing and testing workflows. If you're interested in just in general, all of my resources, you can go right here on my GitHub account, Geostats Guy Resources, and you can see everything that's available, including data sets, videos, workflows, interactive workflows, and so forth. Let's go ahead and run that code. What we've done is we loaded the data set up. It's a very simple geospatial type data set that you can work with. Let's go ahead. We're going to do the very most basic data checks. Now, this is a nice, compact data set to work with. There's so much more we should be doing. I'm not proposing this as best practice for doing machine learning, of course. But we have porosity, a log transform of porosity, acoustic impedance from a geophysical attribute that was inverted, brittleness, um, geomechanical, total organic carbon, more geochemistry, and vitronite reflectance, maturity of the rock. And production would be a fluid production rate 
So in other words, these are wells. They could be any type of fluid wells. We're going to want to build a prediction model for production from a variety of geologic parameters. We're going to do some really basic um, work on the data set, just do a truncation. We do a few negative values. We're going to get rid of the well identification, the drill hole identification. We don't need that. And we'll look at the statistics here, do a quick check. Once again, this is the, we're going to go straight into machine learning for brevity in this case. Okay, we're going to complete the entire data transformation model parameter training, model hyperparameter tuning, and a workflow where we'll do it step by step with low level basic code. Then we'll go ahead with a concise high level method using pipelines, the scikit-learn class. The basic prediction model we're going to use, we're going to have two predictor features. We're going to select those and we're going to predict production from it. The reason I allow you to select the predictor features is you might try this workflow out and you might want to try to make it different and try to get a different model. I want to give people a chance to experiment. We're going to use k-nearest neighbors. Here's a lecture right here. If you're interested, you can click on that link and it'll take you directly to my YouTube channel and you can see this lecture right here. And I have a lot of lectures on machine learning available if you're interested on my YouTube channel and a playlist all nicely organized. So I welcome you to use those features. Our general workflow looks like this. Data preparation feature engineering. The general workflow looks like this. We're going to data preparation feature engineering. We're going to visualize the data. We're going to store some units and full names of the variables for good looking plots. We're going to standardize the predictor features to avoid bias. And due to the fact k-nearest neighbors is a distance-based me method, so we've got to make sure everything's on equal footing. We're going to do feature selection. Once again, you get to pick two features to build your own model doing this. It's kind of fun. And then model training, tuning, and some checking of the model. So let's uh, mainly around visualization. Nothing very advanced here. For data preparation, let's start out with the k-nearest neighbors. We're going to need to go ahead and transform the features so that we have distances that are going to be isotropic. We don't want to create a bias in the model. We apply the transformation and we just look at the statistics afterwards and we can see that transform data has a standard deviation of about 1.0 and it has a mean of very close to zero. So we've accomplished a basic standardization we'd call mean of zero variance of one. It's really a form of affine correction without changing the distribution shape or anything like that. This is where we're going to store the names, the units, the minimum, maximum values. Don't, this is not a big deal. We're just doing it to, for ease of plotting. Let's go ahead and run that. And now we're ready. We're, we have our data all configured and ready to go. And at this step, this is where you can modify the workflow and pick different predictor features. I'm going to pick porosity and brittleness because then we get a petrophysical measure and we get a more of a geomechanical measure. I thought that would be interesting. And we'll go ahead and select those. And for convenience, we'll store them in nice truncated, simplified data frames so that we can work with them with nice, compact, readable code. Predictor features are poor and brittle, and we're going to predict production. Now what we'll do is we'll go ahead. Now this might seem unusual, but this is part of the opportunity gain experience is we're going to add some error to the response feature. The data set we're working with is synthetic. It's really error free. So this allows us the opportunity to add random error in and to observe overfit. If the data is really well behaved, it's difficult to have overfit if we have enough samples available. And so we're going to go ahead and add some error. You can, you can change this and try it out with different levels of error if you're interested. Okay, we ran that code. Now let's go ahead and look at the data. We'll just do a really quick look. This is the original porosity, brittleness, and production. Pink is with the error, and the original is shown in yellow. So you can see, as expected, we added a standard deviation of 1,000, random residual to all the values, random error, and the result is, as expected, we enhanced or increased the variance. So that looks about right. Now let's go ahead. I like it since we're doing two predictor features and one response feature. I think it's a really good idea to do a quick scatter plot and just look at it. Don't you love Inferno? That's a great color, color map for sure. I really like it. So let's go ahead and take a really quick look at a scatter plot. And when we run that, what we'll see is we'll see the original production versus porosity and brittleness, porosity, brittleness, 
and production is the color and you can see how well behaved it is it's very smooth there's no noise with the addition of the noise you get a sense of how the data set has changed so this is i think this is helpful just kind of a quick check and see what we've done to the data how complicated the prediction problem is going to be next we're going to instantiate tune and then predict with the model we're going to use k-nearest neighbors we're going to loop over the hyperparameter, and in the case of k-nearest neighbors, super simple, it's k. That we're going to focus on k right now. Afterwards, we'll take a look at uniform versus distance-based weighting. We'll apply k-fold cross-validation. We calculate the average error over the k-folds. We'll report that. We'll plot the error versus the k hyperparameter. We'll select the minimum error k in k-fold cross-validation, and we'll rebuild the model training with all data and the tune k hyperparameter okay so th this is the job we want to get done now recall the k hyperparameter i have a lecture on k nearest neighbors it's very simple it's the number of nearest training data to use for the local estimator the local estimate low k high model complexity and it becomes more flexible imagine a k of one is a nearest neighbor estimate very much overfit to the data. In fact, it would be perfectly accurate at the data locations and probably wouldn't perform well away from the data. High K will be low model complexity. It becomes very smooth, lower flexibility. And you could imagine if we take all of the data with uniform weighting window, that would be global average estimated everywhere. Now what we can do is instantiate, tune, and then predict our model. So we're gonna adjust the range to you can adjust the range and consider a set of k hyperparameters by changing these lines of code right here k min from 1 to k max 500 ideally the maximum should be the number of data that are available you can figure out how many data there is as a maximum by considering the total available number of data and then subtracting out the fold that will be withheld for testing and so that ratio would be folds minus one divided by number of folds times number of data so if you want this code a line of code here we'll calculate it for you i'll just go ahead and set it as 200 here i'm going to loop over instantiating the k nearest neighbors regression regression model using the distance weighting approach the metric for finding the nearest neighbors will be Euclidean, and the total number of neighbors will vary k in the range between k min, k max. We'll apply k-fold cross-validation with four folds, and we're going to go ahead and calculate the score, which is going to be mean square to error. We'll apply it to a, add it to a matrix, and we can go ahead and plot it when we're done. We can select the lowest error k using this line of code right here, in which we can then get the best k that is tuning our hyperparameter we can go ahead and run that code it's running right now it should run pretty quick in fact and we can go ahead and visualize the results let's see what happened when we visualize the results we can see that we have and mean squared error that drops down as we increase k decrease model flexibility and then it starts to ramp up our best k is probably around 27 and when we use that k to rebuild the model the complete model we get this model right here and all of the available data is shown so we've done hyperparameter tuning we retrained the model and we're ready to make predictions elsewhere okay now i acknowledge k nearest neighbors is lazy modeling um, so we know that really all you've done with all of this is provided the hyperparameter that you would use in the future it's not like we have a portable model it's going to be dependent on the data you use and so forth so let's go ahead and show the same complete workflow everything we just did from standardization of the features through instantiation of a model and looping over multiple hyperparameters we're going to put it all in a pipeline Here's some general comments. The pipeline workflow, workflow steps are, is a list of steps, custom labels, and the associated scikit-learn classes. It's very readable code. You can make all your choices and hyperparameters. You set them as dictionaries with the combined step custom labels and hyperparameter names so that it's 
really nice. You can control the way that it is defined in a way that's maximally readable to you. The workflow scenarios, you can specify a list of choices and hyperparameters that you want to consider. And there's consistent iteration. Every time it runs, it's going to go through the full combinatorial and there's not going to be issues with data leakage or issues with blunders or bookkeeping or tracking. And at the very end, the best model will be selected. The best combination of model hyperparameters and choices will be refit. We can tell it to go ahead and fit it to all of the data and you'll be done, ready to go. You have a model that you can read, ready to use. Here is that workflow. Just look at how compact that is. First, what we do is we instantiate our pipeline. Here's where we're going to specify the steps. Now, the main thing here is that all of your steps before the last step must be transformations. The final step can be if we have an output, a fit. We have standard scalar for our standardization and we have K neighbors regressor. The next, we're going to define a dictionary. The dictionary is going to be all of the parameters that we want to explore. Now, the naming convention is really straightforward. It's going to be whatever label we decided here. We can pick any label we want to give, scalar, and then we're going to specify the parameters. Now, in this case, there's nothing to say. It's just a standard scalar. For the K nearest neighbors, we have a set of hyperparameters that we can consider the n number of neighbors, which is k for k nearest neighbors, the metric we want to use to search for the nearest neighbors, Euclidean, the weights we're going to use when we apply the calculation of the average using neighboring data, we're going to go ahead and use distance weighting. So you look in these two hyperparameters, we specified a list of one value. So it's not going to loop. It's just going to take that one value. But then for the n neighbors, k, we said go ahead with the numpy arrange command. We get an integer list, which is going to go from k min to k max plus 1. And the reason we do k max plus 1, it actually goes up to the value, doesn't include it. And we tell it to go step by 1. And we tell it it must be integers. We'll just overkill we're specify saying make them integers because that's what's expected as k and then we have the parameters so we're going to search over this we can use the grid search cross validation method and all we have to do is pass our pipe our pipeline is going to include the main steps we're going to use the parameters are the ones we want to explore how we're going to score and we can take control of the cross validation and say we want to do k-fold cross validation and we're going to specify the number of folds and we can tell it at the very end to go ahead and refit the model using all of the data. What this does, it's going to instantiate the grid search for the best hyperparameters. Grid search just being exhaustive search of full combinatorial space. And then we'll go ahead and we fit. Now, when you apply this fit command, we gave it the original predictor features and the Y predictor feature all non-standardized because we're going to go ahead and run the standardization as all part of this process. But this fit is going to do everything and at the end give us a final model because we told it to go ahead and refit with all the available data and we go ahead and run that command. It's running right now, looping all of over all those Ks going from one to whatever we put for the maximum value was it 200 or something like that and it's done running. Let's go ahead and see what happened. These are our functions here for quick visualization. Let's do a quick look and see what happened. And it's running right now. The visualize the tune model, which will show us the hyperparameter tuning that happened. And it's going to visualize the best model. So let's, what we have here is we have the Hyperparameter number of nearest neighbors k from 1 through 200. We have the mean squared error shown right here. And we have the resulting model, which was the very best one that we found, which was about, once again, about k equals 27 shown right there. So all of that was accomplished with a really nice, I can't, I can't overstate just how readable this code is and compare it to what we had before which involved 
a lot more steps and iteration, all the individual functions and all the possibilities for blunders and not being consistent with what we were doing from step to step. Now, you might look at the code and say, well, it still looks kind of long. Well, this right here is a really nice specification. We can read the steps very easy. This dictionary right here, we're listing all of the parameters and how we want to iterate or how we want to search through them. Okay, and the resulting model right here. You can look back and forth in the workflow. You'll see it's exactly the same result. We got repeatability, which is really, really nice. Okay, let's go ahead and comment a little bit. Let's compare and contrast the without pipeline and the with pipeline workflows. Code readability, I hope we all agree, much more readable with pipeline. This is a great advantage of the pipeline workflow, in fact. The list of machine learning steps are included in the pipe, pipeline instantiation, which is really nice. The, then the model choices and hyperparameters are listed. It's really nice. Bookkeeping is really good with this approach. I really appreciate that. We can see that everything was run. The standardization, the model construction, it's all run within that class, that abstraction. It makes sure that everything is consistent. The data transformations are applied as they should be. You're not mixing up using the wrong thing. The fit operator conducts cross-validation, runs all the hyperparameters, which is nice, the full combinatorial, after the data transformations and the best models refit to all the data. The predict operator encapsulates the data transformations and prediction with the best refit model. We now have that available to us in the new class that we've created, the pipe, uh, from the pipeline. The best params is a member, class member, that stores all of the hyperparameters and model choices so you know the full model right there. You can do really easy, easy experimentation, try new things out. If you have ease of experimentation, you can try things out. You're not going to get frozen or stuck in what you're doing. You can run a variety of model scenarios and really find out what's the best way to build a model. Control. Well, you know, there are some of us who are control freaks and I don't blame you. I have years of C++ coding. I do like the ability to build things up from the ground and have full control of everything I'm doing. I've done full stack development, front end and back end. And sometimes I like to do that. Now, when we do abstraction and encapsulation, it results in more readable code and ease of running and so forth. But you may find yourself in a situation where you want to work with highly customized workflows. I mean, you're building your own machine learning methodologies. And technically, you could build them consistent with scikit-learn methods, and you could actually use them in this workflow, in this approach. But sometimes may, you may find yourself somewhat limited if you're trying to build very, very complicated workflows. Just an observation. You know, it might be a case that there's always a way to get the job done. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at what we built. We want to retrieve the best model hyperparameters and see what they look like. We'll go ahead and look at the best param class member. No surprises here. The metric we're using was Euclidean to find the nearest neighbors. Uh, we told it to do that. We didn't give any degrees of freedom. That K and nearest neighbors is 27, as I mentioned before. And the weighting is distance-based. We told that it, it couldn't do anything else. This is the model right here we're building. So that's great. It worked. So we have a model. Now if we use that model to make predictions, we know what the model is. We can use it to use the predict command, make predictions at any locations. It's tuned. Let's do a more complicated machine learning model with K nearest neighbors. We're going to go ahead and look at iterating over more choices. Very, very simple. We're going to iterate over the K nearest neighbors, the N neighbors hyperparameter and also will allow the weights to be uniform weighting and distance weighting. Now we can go ahead and just set the parameters. We use the same pipe as before, not a big deal, and we'll go ahead and run that. That's running right now. It's looping over all k's for all weights and it's going to give us an output when we run the fit, it's going to loop over with that available, all the data, do the k-fold cross-validation, find the best hyperparameters, and then we can use the predict command. With this, it'll be our trained model. So really, really cool. Let's go ahead. Now, you'll notice I have a second function for doing this step because of the fact that it actually stores the results looping 
over first the uniform versus distance and then looping over k so i had to kind of unsort those results so not a big deal let's go ahead and look at it no surprises here we got instead we now have uniform red distance based blue distance based outperforms uniform that's not a surprise right because when using k nearest neighbors with uniform it's like just the local average versus uh, distance based gets to be more like inverse distance weighting which is just a better interpolator so it does a pretty good job you can see and it picks the best hyperparameters how do we know that well let's go ahead and take a look and see what the best hyperparameters were turned out 27 K same as before and distance weighting was the best it didn't pick uniform weighting and we could see that from the plot the red and blue points it was pretty clear it outperformed now let's do an even more complicated case now for k nearest neighbors i feel like we've kind of exhausted the complexity and so let's switch to decision trees we pick decision trees because there's a whole variety of different hyperparameters we could look at I'm going to go ahead and start running this. It does take a little bit of time to run. We're going to consider a maximum tree depth going all the way from 1 to 9. We're going to consider the maximum leaf nodes going from 2 to 30. In other words, the number of regions in the decision tree. Or terminal nodes is another way they're called. And the minimum samples per leaf going everything from 1 to 9. Now, it's going to loop over all of these. If you want more information about decision trees, I do have lectures on my YouTube channel on decision trees. I have a bunch of examples. They're available. This is done running. We go ahead and we instantiate this grid search CV with the pipe for the tree, which is just going to be decision tree. When we work with a decision tree, we don't have to transform the data. We don't have a distance calculation in the predictor feature space. And so we're fine without the transformation. We're going to go ahead and use the parameters that are specified here. And by running that code, we went ahead, took the original data, no transformation. We tried out all these hyperparameters. Now, what happened? Let's go ahead and visualize the model. Let's see what model we built right here. And so this was our best tuned, and we're showing it with all the available data right here. Okay, so this is our best model. How do we know it's best? How do we know it performed? Well, we could go and look at the error metric that was used, which is the mean squared error. We can go ahead and look at the combination of all the hyperparameters, and we could sort that out and look at the plot and see how it varied. We could visualize it in 2D, 3D. That would be actually really cool. I didn't take the time to do that, but you might want to go ahead and see what they were. Tree max depth, 7 maximum leaf nodes 29 that's number of regions in the near in the decision tree and the minimum samples per leaf of eight that's fascinating to me and i do suspect that using too few minimum samples per leaf is not reliable because it's not a good prediction of the average in the region if you don't have enough data okay so that's really cool we ran that i hope that this was useful to you i find pipelines are very powerful for building really good workflows I even, I even built a workflow tomorrow for the Geostats Congress where I'm doing a basics and machine learning workshop with the uh, attendees and other public people who are just joining in. And what I wanted to do, I, was, I wanted to generalize and say, okay, let me make basic functions that can work with any hyperparameters, can work with any type of machine learning model. And what I found is by using pipelines, I was able to use the parameters actual variables which was really cool in the function calls the hyperparameters became variables in the function calls and so that abstraction allowed me a greater degree of flexibility so all kinds of great things you can do with pipelines now if you're interested i have a lot of other resources available to you i share a lot of resources and of course i'm a professor so if you're with a company and you want to work together and you're interested in supporting phd students on joint research and collaboration we're totally open to that we work directly with companies students and myself assisting inside the company i also do consulting i'm happy to discuss anytime all right i hope this is helpful to you once again i'm michael perch and i'm an associate professor at the university of texas at austin in the cockrell school of engineering and the jackson school of geosciences where i teach and conduct research on data analytics mostly in spatial context geostatistics and machine learning 
All right, stay well.